Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton. Welcome to podcast number 81. 19 more to 100. We are plugging along. Um, before we get into this interesting patient of mine, Susan and I wanted to uh, make an announcement about a, a wonderful uh, program that we have started or we have started this week. Right. So if you haven't opened your emails that came out on Tuesday, be sure that you go back and open it because it's got some time sensitive information that you don't want to miss. <clears throat> this is our very first um, Tough to Treat clinical mentoring membership program that we have launched and we're just excited as can be about it. Um, we're going to be able to do so many cool things in this membership site with you, including weekly calls about your clients and what you want help with. We have a very cool library that we're building with resources. Yes, and we're also yes. going to um, just really be able to connect on a much deeper level and really, really provide a, a bit more personal service to helping everybody overcome that fear of the tough to treat client. Yes, this is a, certainly a, an extension of the podcast and so much more. I mean, we've uh, put together a great program and uh, we, we, look, we look forward to sharing uh, more of our clinical pearls and helping you personally solve your tough to treat patients. Because I know a lot of times we, 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 you know, we're looking for mentors and we're, and I certainly, when I first started as a therapist, I was looking for mentorship for so long. And I think that's uh, really uh, important for, for, for anybody, no matter how, how many years of experience that you have. So mm -hmm. we look forward to uh, you joining with us uh, on this program. So if you want to, if you're not on our email list, uh, there's a couple ways if you're interested in, in, in this membership to get a hold of us. You can email myself at erica at ericamello.com or susan at susan at embody-pt.com or opt in to our website, toughtotreat.com. Either one of those ways uh, you'll, we'll, uh, we'll get you on, on the newsletter. And if all else fails, you can always go to the Facebook group and message us. Absolutely. We'll get you onto our newsletter. Sounds good. So this is a uh, uh, very brief intro. This is a 19-year-old uh, soccer player, very elite soccer player here in New York that uh, I am treating. And typical, you know, case of low back pain, but once again, <laughs> the atypical source to his problem. And what's very interesting, and I'll just put this thought in everybody's head, really significant back pain, but can run, no problem and not do side to side. So listen to the podcast and you'll find out. <laughs> Enjoy. Hi everybody, this is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton and welcome to episode number 81 of Tough to Treat. And this is, I'm gonna just get right into it. This is a patient who is 19 years old, a male, somewhat of an elite soccer player. He's in college, he's a sophomore in college, and basically a uh, high-level, high-level soccer player and uh, has had low back pain for many years. Uh, you think he's 19 years old. How, how many years can someone have back pain? But um, very much of a typical sort of lord lordotic posture and uh, had the you know, MRI and X-ray and they said he had a sort of a pars fracture, stress reaction, and that's really what I got out of him did not have, did not get, I didn't see the MRI or the x-ray. This has been going on for some years now. Uh, and he basically had been seeing another therapist up where he lives. He doesn't live directly in New York. Uh, and basically had been working on his pelvis, probably mostly, you know, he basically felt that his pelvis was going out. This is what I think, what has the story that has been told to him. Like he wouldn't, 19 year old soccer player wouldn't say my pelvis is going out. That's just not something that these kids would say, right? So, so that's the story that he has been told. And that's the story that is in his head. So uh, I'll just briefly go into, his, no other past medical history. This was, he fractured his, uh, you know, metatarsal on his right foot. Uh, probably about a couple of years ago, he did that four times. No, no, excuse me. He, fra he sprained his ankle on his right ankle four times and he fractured his fourth met once. Right foot. That's the, the basic 
movement history is, is uh, what am I, his, basically his only significant past medical history. No other issues except his stress fracture, stress react to the L5S1 some years ago. Uh, his other injury history is basically just some right hip flexor strain, uh, things like that. And when he went to see other therapists, they told him he needed to strengthen his glutes, get his core going, et cetera, et cetera. And when he worked out with the team, they really wanted him to focus on his glutes. He, he basically stands with this sort of typical lordosis, you know, interior pelvic tilt. He ended up putting on muscle, put on 10 pounds of muscle, which helped a little bit. Uh, but when I saw him, his back had been flared up again. And the quote that I got was, I'm out of alignment and I need to realign myself. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay and so the first thing i'm sitting there thinking is i need to debunk this because this is not helpful for 19 years old especially an elite athlete you know who really is is not you can't keep thinking this because this is not i mean to, i need to you know nip that in the bud from the beginning don't you agree susan because i just can't I proceed totally totally <laughs> because it's starting to speak of um a complete lack of self-efficacy and being able to take care of himself that he needs somebody to align him or he's doing something to make himself be in quote unalignment or pelvis out or something else. And, um, you know, we, we've learned so much that, that we just know that that is, that is not helpful information at all. Oh. And in fact, it can actually drive sensitivity up. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So he, in his story, he, so I debunked that. Uh, and, and, and I think, I, he got it. I'm, I'm like, well, how did you put yourself back in alignment? It's like a typical shotgun maneuver with the ab and adduction with, you know, that we all learn in, in, at some point in our, out, you know, our courses that we take. Um, and that, once again, I explained to him, it gave you, it, you know, it may give you some short-term relief, but it's really not correcting your movement strategy. He had no problem running. So he had right-sided low back pain. So that ran mostly lower, L5S1. He had a secondary complaint of right-sided sort of subscap pain, like subscapular pain, I would say T10, T11, T8, like around that area. Uh, but it was more right hand went to the PSIS upper, you know, L5S1. The other hand went up just below like this around the seventh and eighth rib on that same side. He is right-handed. No problem running, zero problem. He had no back pain when he ran. He said when he moves side to side, his lateral movements on the soccer field, that bothered him. He went skiing this winter. He got on a snowboard. That bothered him. Because you're on a snowboard, you're in that sort of side to side movement. Mm -hmm. So that really bothered him a lot. So it was the side to side. And I'm going to stop there and let me know what your thoughts are because I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. You know? That is interesting. Yeah. So my thoughts are is it side to side or is it some sort of rotational component that gives him that lateral movement just kind of off the top of my head thinking you know is yeah. it ba is it coronal base side to side or is it flexion and side bending you know extension side bending kind of side to side movements that are giving him you know the ability to kind of you know switch back and forth on the soccer field you know right. not just running straight ahead but you know to the left to the right to the left you know right and he's a, um, i believe a midfielder mm -hmm. so he's he is running side to side back and back pedaling as well mm -hmm. um yeah. okay anything else or should we keep going no i i think we've other than the four ankle sprains on the right yes and then a fracture on the right foot yes yeah yeah so um and then I'm hip just, flexor strain i'm sorry go ahead that's that's all right i'm just guessing that he probably is spending a lot of time on his right side <laughs> he well he was <laughs> <laughs> okay he there's certainly your was <laughs> there's your first clue everything's <laughs> happening over there what's going on he certainly okay. was all right so <laughs> he you know it, it's interesting because i'm trying to like not once again because I see, we see these patients who have been elsewhere or who've had this, you know, I, I, knew, I, I knew he had his pelvis worked on it. I, I mean, it, at this point, it's not his lumbar lordosis, his, his stress fracture, his stress reaction that happened three years ago. That's the problem. And he says he keeps pulling out his hip flexors. I'm like, well, you're standing with an interior pelvic tilt. You're, you're just, you may be over recruiting your hip flexors. You may not be. 
that doesn't kind of like factor in a side to side movement. You're not, that's not like the main movement pattern, the main, you know, that's not the main muscle at the party here when you're going side to side. So I took a look at him in standing. So I, I, I just got a baseline in standing. And interestingly, his pelvis was way to the right. His pelvis was way, mm -hmm. so I just stand behind him, marry my feet to theirs. He put my hand on the top of the iliac crest. His pelvis was way off to the right. His thorax and his head were way to the left. So he was almost, so he was really net left. He was net left. Mm -hmm. However, I said, you know, your, 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 um, your center of mass is really off to the left side. He's like, you know, it's funny because I seem that I, over the years, I've spent a lot of time on my right. I'm like, well, no wonder. I mean, you've sprained your ankle four times. You fractured your fourth metatarsal. You know, he's, he's like, I probably offloaded that. Said, I'm sure you did. You probably did. Okay. So that's how I, that's how I saw him. Then what I did was I actually, because I think that it's important that, um, that these patients feel felt, so to speak. So I went in, I palpated the iliocostalis, all the muscles in his, in his, in his back, just to, to give homage, I guess, to, to his low back to say, <laughs> yes, you know, like, I don't want to, some people are like, you don't have to touch my back. I know it's not my back, but some people want you to touch their back. So, so like he wants to, I want him to feel felt. So I went in and I poked around. He was very sore, tender to palpation. I, I noted like on seventh and eighth ribs, lower down, not so much. He definitely had an interior translation at L4-5. Not surprisingly, he is, his net sort of rib cage, his trunk, his trunk was to the left. So I had him, I, I watched him, I watched him walk just to see how he did sort of straight plane. Mm -hmm. Didn't see much there. And because I've been taking, uh, I didn't treat him virtually, but mm -hmm. I took him, I started him in the clinic and I started to take pictures like I did virtually and mm -hmm. mark screenshots of in very mm -hmm. narrow base of support, a very wide base of support and a normal base of support. So he, when he stood normally, he was on his left. When he stood narrow, he was way on his left. When he stood wide, he was pretty even. So for me, that indicates that he potentially has something going on in his lower extremity in the narrow base of support that his his up his above that he can't adapt for adapt to, mm -hmm. so to speak. So that's how I viewed that. And knowing his history of his foot, I said maybe his foot is relevant here. And that's just what I did in standing. So he's when he narrows his base of support, he really shifts more to the left. Correct. Okay, got it. Correct. Um, so I went in and because he had, um, so I felt his lumbar spine, I, because of his history in his foot, I went down to the foot and I explained to him that the fact that you can run and it's pretty sagittal, I mean, it's hard on the back foot. I mean, running's hard, period, end of report, but for a foot, for a person who's had a foot issue, doing side to side, you know, back and forth on a soccer field is harder on the foot than running is because running is straight plane, but side to side is really hard on a foot that you can't control. And I explained that to him before because his story didn't make sense to me. It's like, why can he go side to side? And he, and he, why can't he go side to side, but he can run. And I'm like, well, let's figure body regions of the body. That's hard for the foot to do side to side. It's hard for the trunk to the thorax, the thorax, the thorax to do. It's hard for it's hard, it's hard to do side to side generally mm -hmm. uh, for me, especially if you're living on one side. Like I live on my right leg. I have a hard time going side to side to my left, but that's, but that's just me. So What's his kick, I, what was his kicking leg? Did he kick left? He kicked right. So he kicks right too. He kicks right. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I'll just throw this as an aside because I tested his just, I just did this quickly I tested his one-legged heel raise on the right, just to see. Mm -hmm. He could barely lift his heel up. It was like a two. Mm -hmm. And I don't normally test that, but I just had a hunch. His left foot, he was about a four, four plus. So he had very poor, poor, poor strength in that right leg. And I'm like, well, is he kicking with his hip flexors? What's he using? And he's, you know, how is he pushing off? And how is he kicking? He kicked with the right. And then he, when he, when he pushed off, he said he pushes off better with his right. I'm like, how could you do that? You have no push off. You have no calf strength. So 
And this is just some, some visits later, we were problem mm-hmm. solving together. So in terms of any lumbar for the, for the listeners, uh, I didn't feel a need to do any lumbar cardinal plane movement like forward bend, backward bend. I could have. I could have done a side bend. I, I, but I, I didn't because I, it, I didn't think that was relevant to his side to side movement, to be honest. I, you know, this is my clinical patterning so that I see. I could have. I, I felt his low back. I felt that I devoted enough time to the low back, you know, and just palpating it and, you know, just getting in there and, and noting some anterior translation. But I didn't feel a need to really evaluate it because I, when I took a look at his movement pattern, so when I had him, side to side is a bit hard for me to evaluate, to assess. So what I did is, I mean, I did, I did it, but I watched him squat. Let me say, just squat for me. Let me see what you look like. You got to get in a squat position to go side to side. You don't just go side to side standing up. So I had him squat and he went way to the left. Like, and I mean, like, like he almost fell over to the left. And so his trunk. So what I noticed was as he squatted, his trunk went first and then his feet went like he had no control at all. And I'm, you know, a lot of these athletes, they have, they're good at their sport, but when it comes to different movement patterns and other isolated strength movements, like, like arm work, they're, they're, they show a significant deficit. Uh, so what I ended up doing after that is I, I had him squat. I looked at his foot. I looked at his foot. I looked at his pelvis. I looked at his back. I looked at his trunk. I knew it wasn't the pelvis because there's nothing in his history to say that he would have anything wrong with his pelvis. There's no loss of control. He's 19. Does he have a weak core? Maybe, but that doesn't mean his issues in the pelvis, you know? Uh, so I ended up videoing him and then taking a picture again at the bottom of the squat. And he's a quick learner. So I said, see how your trunk is over to the left. You're just, you're not loading your right foot. So when you're on your left side for so long, because of all the issues on your right, you've lost options. Your right side cannot adapt to movement patterning. So you just, you just, you're right. You need to wake the right side up. So what I did was I ended up just doing some, once again, just a modification to his foot. I, I, for the purpose of the podcast, I just went in and just put a subtalar joint in neutral, put it down there. And then I had him just, I said, just squat for me now. And I held it. So I had my hands on his back, on his trunk. And I just held what I did with my, so I took my shoes off. I put my right foot against his right foot. I just held the, held my correction for lack of a better word. He squatted and he was better, probably 80% better, but he was still going off to the left. So, and I felt like this resistance coming from his, like you talked about earlier, Susan, the rotation. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, so it was like he squatted and then halfway down, he was just going all the, he's still going to the left. And I don't, and at the time I didn't, I didn't know why. So I'll stop there. And if you, do you have any questions or anything? Um, I'm not sure if I have any questions. I have some okay. observations. Okay. Feel free. Observe. And I'm just, <laughs> um, yeah. My, my first thought is though, though, the weakness that you saw, like he was unable to do heel raises. Not very well. No. Single leg heel raises. And it wasn't because his foot had a lack of range of motion. It was because he, endurance-wise, couldn't do it. Yes. Um, and this has been going on for a long time. How old are those ankle fractures? Uh, he's 19, probably five. Between five and three years, maybe. I okay, so it's been a while since he's had one. I think he had one last year. But okay. Maybe, but um, not, like four is a lot. Yeah, but. this 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 setup that I'm seeing in my mind is just, it's really looking like a lateral shift to me. Interesting. And I'm wondering why he's in a lateral shift. Yeah. And if he's got concurrent, concomitant weakness in his S2, S1, S2, I'm beginning to wonder if there's a little bit of a nerve root issue going yes. on here. Yeah. And, um, and it's showing up in all other kinds of things because I've seen people sprain their ankles when it has nothing to do with the ankle or anything to do with like stepping in a hole or anything, but a complete, but a power outage. Yeah. You know, yes. um, because the, you know, the, the, um, they're just not getting the same overflow 
neurological overflow that they should be getting. So I'm just, that's, that's kind of what I'm envisioning here yeah. is like that this is what's happening and that if you can get him set and switch, he's not reactive as far as like down the leg, like, like neural sensitivity in that way. No. But it, this is, this is not the 19 year old soccer player who can't do heel raises. Isn't, isn't, and you know, is it, is it, that's not adding up for me. Um, you know, and I'm just, so I'm, there's, there had to have been something that happened in there. Um, but I'm also kind of like thinking, okay, so if you can get his foot to shift and you can get him to go down straight, but then he still at some point has to shift left with his trunk. Yes. You know, yes. so they're definitely, there's, you know, in this, and so this is what, this is kind of my line of thinking of where I'm headed here. Because um, uh, shifting to the left, you know, if, if his trunk shifts over to the left, that's actually rotating this way, shifting left side. So I'm thinking that what's happening here is, you know, that's maybe where kind of the psoas, and I'm not a big picker on the psoas, but I'm thinking when you see lateral shifts, yeah. I have to think that the psoas is involved because what that and the quadratus is what keeps you laterally shifted. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, and that may be where that's coming in as he got into a movement pattern to get off of that nerve root. Yeah. You know, even yeah. though it didn't give him pain down the leg, if yeah. he, if there was something that was happening at that at level of the nerve root, um, and um, he his his body his brain did something to get him off of that. Mm -hmm. And it has not allowed him to go back. Right. You know, right. he's gotten into that movement pattern and that's where he stays. Mm -hmm. And when he has to go lateral, um, you know, he kicks right. So he, it's kind of probably automatic to stick his left foot up underneath his trunk so that, you know, he can kick right because you can't have your left leg way out to the side to kick right. It's got to, you got to yeah. legs yeah. cross in soccer. I've watched enough of it to see how that happens. Um, you know, so it's just kind of like, hmm, you know, but I'm finding that in the squat, even when he does, that's what made it kind of trigger for me. It's like, hmm, he should have been able to, you yeah. know, and 80% of it got better, but there's still that piece in there that's not responding. Correct. Right. So. And, and I was kind of surprised as well. I'm like, oh God, he can't do a heel race. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, the pars fracture, bar, stress reaction. I don't have any of the, the findings in it. So uh, any paper probably just was all you know subjective he's telling me this and I was like and he's like you know maybe I should do heel race I'm like go for it you know I'm just like you can try go ahead mm -hmm. absolutely get some power back let's see if we can make that better doing other things but I agree 100% do it and he's been doing that um, so I'll give you a, a couple things on that so I agree mm -hmm. you know and he has shifted he's extremely it's interesting so I'll just finish the eval real quick because he he didn't have any, I, you know, I'm make, condensing this. I asked all of your typical questions I and mean, he's 19, you know, how much at this point mm -hmm. he has medical history can he have uh, no bowel or bladder, none of that, nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was the lack of power, which was stunning to me uh, mm -hmm. because he is such a, an elite athlete, you know, and I always say athletes can compensate until they can't, you know, it's just, they're so right. good at compensating that they just end up doing that for a long time. And I think I'm just he, wondering if he found a way to run on the outside of his foot so that he didn't have to use his uh, uh, calf muscles to power him through. Probably. I mean, no, he's using, is he does using something else. Yeah, he's using some sort of mechanical energy or something to allow, you know, going straight ahead, he may be able to compensate enough with some other things. But for the for the side to side, that's where he can't. Right. You know, and there's only so much mechanical energy from the IT band will give you to, you know, kind of hold you as you go sideways. Right. But, you know, it can't I mean, do it all for sure. That's very interesting. Yeah, you didn't happen I mean, to do a reflex test on him, did you? No, I did not. I, that is, I, when I admit that I did not do that. But It'd be uh, interesting to bang yeah. on those Achilles reflexes, especially with him uh, prone and his feet off the table, like lengthened. Yeah, I didn't even have bang a reflex on him, hammer with not me. Not sitting. Yes. Yeah, not yes. sitting, but, yes. but straight out, you know, with his feet off the, ta yes. with his feet off yeah. the table and just really kind of just bang away and see if if there's a difference there there may yes. or may not be yes you know what i will do that i actually yeah, just, um, just as a thought yeah i, I just you know it'd be kind of interesting to see because you know 
Uh, and this is interesting because this is really important because you don't have to have pain to have a power outage. Right. You know, it, it, these things happen without radiculopathy. I mean, he has back pain and it isn't gotten better. And he obviously doesn't like compression in that area because when he goes side to side, it probably compresses more than if he goes straight ahead. Yes. So it's yeah, sensitized, the, you know. Right. But how does he get that power pushing off that right leg when he runs? Mm -hmm. and, and that just blows my mind, you know? Uh, I did do your typical, I did do a slump test. I did a straight leg raise. I didn't think I was going to find anything that was all negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when I, I just literally, I got, I, I, I got so sidetracked after I saw that heel raise. I was like, oh my God. Uh, but he, you know, once again, I just wanted him to feel, he knows how I treat. So he's, it's, he didn't expect me to do a full blown, like normal exam that he's had before. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I wanted to live up to that reputation. <laughs> so I just did, you know, my, my, my assessment where I look at everything in the relationship between each region of the body. And when I corrected his foot, yes, he squatted better, but it wasn't great. It wasn't, it wasn't, there was a remaining 20%. So I went in and I just did uh, I just gave him a little support to his trunk, did a little decompression, put my hands on his rib cage, just gave him a little breathing space in his rib cage. And then I had him squat and he was pretty good. And, mm -hmm. you know, he went down, I just gave him another input to the nervous system, mm -hmm. you know, just some stability and he was fine. So fast. So, so this was the first visit and I explained to him that, you know, I didn't want to harp on the weakness too much because he's, I just said, you know, you want to do your, I think you should do them. You do them at this point. We need, you need to focus on them. Just mm -hmm. do them while you're standing, do them, whatever, you know, just do mm -hmm. them. So that was, you know, he went home with that. So um, because he, I was, I had to explain to him why I felt that the foot was in the picture as well mm -hmm. as perhaps the thorax, maybe less so because of his prior movement history with the four ankle frat, the four ankle sprains and the right fourth net fracture. And I didn't want to go into the whole pars, lumbar, potential mm -hmm. nerve. I just, it's just wasn't going to be helpful for him no. at this point. So he was like, oh, my foot, of course, that makes complete sense. And so when I, 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 I showed him in a couple different tasks, so then I got him in a deep squat. Okay, I corrected his foot once again. I got him in a deep squat. I gave himself some support once again, you know, under his thorax, the de some decompression. He went side to side and he was significantly better. I mean, well, I'm standing there with my foot on his foot trying to, to, to prevent him from sliding over. And it did not reproduce his back pain. Prior to this, in the, when I had him just do side to side, it, just to me, to me to quickly look at it. Mm-hmm. He, it bothered him. So, but mm -hmm. I didn't uh, use that as my first assessment tool. I used the squat because you need to squat to get down into that position. Once I determined the drivers in that position, I, I, I kept, what well, we corrected them, neutralized them, had him squat. Then he went side to side and he was much better. He didn't have any pain there. So mm -hmm. I explained that I, I felt that the foot was the issue, the main driver because of the, because of all of your old ankle issues, you've all mm -hmm. floated that right side. You have no options for movement. And when you end up going side to side, there's something in your body that you just cannot keep the, tr the trunk or the thorax over the pelvis, or you can, you have poor foot control. And I was trying to explain it in his language, because mm -hmm. if you're going to the right side, and you can't control that in your foot, and you've got, and you're, you just, you just can't, when, you, when you're in a, in a lunge position and you step to the side, that right foot should have some decent control. If you're not, if you're losing control there, and you're, you're sort of wiggle wobble all the way up, so to speak, you know, pelvis, trunk, pelvis, and thorax, you're, 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 you're going to over recruit some of those muscles just to stabilize you. That makes sense. You know, you're going to have mm -hmm. to do that. And that is why when he put his hand on his back, he ran up and down, like literally up to the thorax, all the way down to the back. So he got that. He got that. So I sent him home the first visit with those heel raises. I know they were going to be hard. I gave him seated heel raises too, just to sort of just warm up a little bit. And then I said, go into standing. That's a problem. Go into sitting and just do, you know, just do volume, do 50, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, do as many as you can. Um, so that's what I did the first session. Should I keep going or are you, you're good? No, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking this in because it's, um, I find it interesting, but I also find um, 
you know, I think this is a really important point at, at this, you know, and I, I would not harp on the power outage in the foot either, other than I would find it interesting that you can do this on the left, but you can't do it on the right, you know, and, and who knows? I mean, at this point, what are you going to do? You're not, you know, but he's not going to go have surgery. I mean, it's just like, you know, this isn't, there isn't any reason to give him anything else to pathologize. He's already right. pathologized his pelvis to death. My yes. pelvis is out. My pelvis is out of alignment. My da, 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 da. And all you were pointing out to him is that how quickly can we get your body to change? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what he needed to know. He needed to know that, look, you do, you move this way. See, here's some pictures. What if we did this and this and see if we can get that to change? And then yeah. he did. He was able to make it change and he took himself out of some of his misery. Right. You know, so the thing is, is he's walking out the door. Okay, yeah, it seems like I'm a little weak on that side. I could exercise it. Sure, it's not going to hurt anything to do it. You know, it may help. Maybe, you know, it's just the, the way he's holding himself. He just can't, his brain just isn't going to activate the, ga the gastroc muscle. But we get him a little bit different. And then maybe it start. you know, the brain is like, oh, now we need the gastroc muscle to work. Mm -hmm. You know, but it didn't need to work if he was on his left side and his trunk is way over to the left. Correct. The brain is probably like gastroc wet. No, we're working this motor pattern here. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. You know, so how we line ourselves up under gravity oftentimes dictates what muscles turn on and what muscles don't. You know, so maybe when he's running and he tilts forward and there's a soccer ball and the eyes are going, he's in a different position and his brain activates the gastroc muscle and he probably doesn't have a problem running straight ahead down the field. Yeah, no, he doesn't. But then when he gets yeah. into the side to side stuff, he kind of goes drifts into that pattern. And that's where that motor pattern is so strong on him. Yeah. It's become dominant pattern. Right. So I like the idea, you know, that you're just kind of like helping him, you know, it's not like there's anything wrong with the foot. Like you're not, you know what I'm saying? I know people hear the word correct. And it's not like the foot is incorrect. It's that all Eric is doing is putting her hand or her foot on top of his foot to give him some input so that he can get a feel for, I must be shifting off my foot every time I go to squat because I'm flying over here to the left. And all she was doing, all you're doing is giving him input so that he can kind of, oh, I think I need to keep weight on this foot in this way because that's the change you were looking for to see if it would help him move differently. Correct. And it did. Oh. You yeah. know, and so, and that's the novel input to the system, like you were saying, and that's what he's going home with. Here's a guy that's coming in with a pelvis that's out and misaligned and thinking he has to be dependent on somebody to get it back into alignment because he, he's done something to himself. Yeah. And now he's walking out the door going, cool, I get to do these calf raises. And if as long as I kind of do this, this way, my back doesn't bother me as much. So now he's kind of onto something like it's in his control and he understands movement and those types of things. So yeah, you're right. You're speaking in a language that makes a lot of sense to him. That's meeting the people where they are. Yeah. He's a quick learner. And yeah. All I, you know, yeah. And all I did was basically, I just had him lift his heel up and I like, let me just put your heel down. And I just literally put, you know, put my hand on the heel, placed it down. That was it. And he did what is, oh. you know, did his thing. So he went home with that and he, and, and he's a very quick learner. I mean, he, and he's very motivated. You know, mm -hmm. that's just like my Sure. Kind of thing, Wants know? to play so, soccer. Mm -hmm. I know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so during this time when they're not playing right now, uh, during the pandemic, he's focusing on rehabbing, which is, is, is good for him. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So I gave him... Uh, I gave him a program geared towards the foot, okay? So I gave him an, some self-release of his foot with the ball, have him roll on a dumbbell, release some of his intrinsic muscles, uh, release some of those uh, that, that, you know, some of those mucky, for lack of, lack of a better word, mm -hmm. uh, areas around the subtalar joint. Uh, I gave him just a, a bit of a release, some of the, from the calf a little bit, because he, it, believe it or not, he did have some, some tightness there, but it was really not, it's not what he did most. It was really mostly just releasing, because we walk everywhere. I mean, the minute you walk, I mean, every, who loves, everybody loves having their foot worked on, you know? So mm -hmm. he, he did that. So that was his thing, his self-release. I sent him home with that. And then I gave him some foot control. I do like, um, uh, so back, he, I gave him backwards walking. He backpedals on the soccer field. He can't put his heel down. Mm -hmm. So he, he can backpedal, but he can't backwards walk and put the heel down. 
that's how poorly controlled this guy's foot was, mm -hmm. right? Because he's like, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, yes, you can. Just heal. So I had to teach him that. So we spent a lot of time doing that. Then I tr gave him a toe heel progression. Let's say it's his right foot, right foot in front, left foot behind, go up on your heel, go up on your toes on the right foot, go up on your toes on the back foot, lower the front heel down, and then swing the left leg through. Left heel up, right foot in the back. So left heel's front foot, right heel's back foot, left heel up, right heel up, and then lower the front foot down. So that's like a toe heel progression. Mm -hmm. So I gave him that. And that's to this day is still not easy for this kid. Okay. And so and that would really focus on the calf as well in mm -hmm. getting, you know, that right calf stronger in, in a more functional way for him. Uh, and then I proceeded to give him, we call, I've spoken about this before in the podcast, sling squats. Those are basically squats with your knees extended, your knees flexed against the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I gave him, uh, once again, moving along, just split squats because he, I'm still seeing this loss of control. Okay. I wanted to incorporate some movement with, I, I, the kid didn't have a ton of time to do this stuff. So I wanted to give him some uh, upper body exercise to do while he was doing this. So I had him wrap a TheraBand around his arm. Like he's got a bracelet around both arms, like a yellow TheraBand just wrapped around both. And so when he did his split squats, I had him put the yellow TheraBand around mm -hmm. his arms and just pull out at about 5% to get some thoracic control. He did that and he actually helped quite a bit. Go yeah, figure. that's, go that's fig, always go like figure. great. That's always a great trick to get the lats to pull in a little bit, you know, and that's what you're doing. The arms, the, you know, the, the hands can be up at the shoulder. They can be, you know, at 90 degrees of the elbows, but those kinds of things, you know, through that range is helpful sometimes to just give their neurological system something else to do. Yeah, exactly. Pro provide some input in some different ways and and just see what the motor expression is when they come out of it mm -hmm. that's yeah. what's nice is because you know and the, i find it interesting you know the, the thing about the you know the foot progression that you know the heel toe toe heel to, you know thing but um it is hard for people to do because walking and running i dare say is a spinal cord function activity Mm. It doesn't require a cognitive control. We can, de we can, we, you know, you could, there's been so many motor control studies where, you know, the, you know, the uh, even higher levels of the brainstem are gone and the cat will walk, you know, around the circle on the, you know, thing. Um, wow. You know, we know, we, we do know that. Um, but what you're doing is you're imposing, you know, a, so walking and, and running can be more spinal cord level, but playing soccer is not. That was a skill that had to be developed in time. Right. How do you right. approach the ball? How do you slow down? How do you kick with speed? How, where, you know, all of those things. And that comes up with progression. But what you were doing here with him is you were taking him completely out of pattern and giving him something to do, which was going to help re-coordinate him in a new way. You know, just it's a new skill that you're actually asking him to do, which is only going to make his motor skills more variable. Exactly. You know, and it, plus it was a challenge for him. It was. And he wanted to be challenged. Yes. You know, That's that, hard you to know do. It's, and I can't even imagine how many times somebody probably laid this kid down and dug around on his, on his quadratus muscle until, you know, or mm -hmm. yanked yeah. his hip around and. Yep. You know, you know, <laughs> I know. I didn't, I, to what end? Because he lay him down and massage into his quadratus and nothing's going to change. No, it's the same but strategy. But what did change was when you put a new strategy in and he needed to kind of motorically figure it out. Yes. And his brain kind of started saying, we need to stop over recruiting here so we can hold on and move our shift over here. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, if you you know, and all that, all that was, was just coming in with just a different eye and a different viewpoint to, to help him do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because he said to me, well, why would my foot help my back? And I'm like trying to explain to him in ways that, you know, when people like for, we're going to go back to when I use the word correct, I always tell patients, I'm just doing what your muscle should be doing or something mm -hmm. like that. I'll, I'll explain yeah, that to them in, in ways. Exactly. So what I, I said to him, well, I said, you know, it's, I explained to him different input to the nervous system. I said, you know, it's also changing your relationship with your body to gravity. I'm giving you just better options for movement. I'm giving you better choices. So the relationship of the foot to the back is, is that, you know, when, you're, when your foot is better control, it just changes how your body responds to gravity. And I think he got that. Mm -hmm. 
so I progressed him for the foot program and, and I went along my merry way. And then I started to add the TheraBand arms and I'm just fast forwarding, really fast forwarding. I started to have him do uh, really deep squat side to side with the mm -hmm. TheraBand on the arms. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, to, I did some, I have access to Pilates equipment. So I did, uh, people are going to say, well, did you do, do any hands-on? I did a fair amount of it. I did a lot of work with his foot at the beginning, uh, but less so towards the now because he's, he can self-release and actively release by moving. You know, this is what our brain does. We don't sit there and we don't need to dig into people's feet. If I find that I can't, if, there, if I find that it's necessary, I'll do that. I did that at the beginning. I, at the beginning, that's when you're trying to change uh, movement. Uh, and if, need, if something needs to get released, I'll do it. And I, and I didn't, did, didn't touch his back. And I ended up doing a little bit of, uh, I didn't do anything with regards to his trunk in terms of release work. It was really more, I'll explain this in a second. I gave him some upper extremity, mobil, um, upper extremity movement. But mm -hmm. I did do hands-on, okay? I've done a lot of work with, recently with getting the patient into a movement like a squat. Okay. And I'll use his foot and I'm having him, I'm like putting my foot once again against his right foot, you know, modifying it in a way, mm -hmm. preventing him from doing his non-optimal movement pattern. And then I'll have him squat. I'll have him go side to side. So I'm, I'm almost training him. I'm training him with the right movement pattern that I'm providing with my does that make sense? You know, it's, yeah. like, it's like, he's not doing it on his own. I'm with my hands. I'm, I've got my hands on his strong. He's squatting. He's side to side. I'm helping him move better with my manual input into his. Yeah, you're system. guiding him. Yes. And, and so he's learning that there's more variance to squat than just that one way. Right. I did hands mm -hmm. on the wall. I had him, uh, I had him uh, just do free squat. I had, I got him on the, the trap table. I had him do some push throughs with the bar, like supine overhead. I did some release work in there for the arms if he needed, because of his, his trunk was somewhat compressed. I did various things. Those were my hands on and I did more than that, but I'm, you know, I, I want to get to the movement, uh, because I, he, I believe that we need to give some input into their system, whether it's verbal manual, even when they're at these high levels, because they need to have focused, deliberate practice with, with cueing, I think. So I gave him skull crushers, flies, all for his upper body. No surprise there, not that strong. I mean, really quite weak, to be honest. So he, he did those on his own. And now we're at the point where I am having him do side lunges. Okay. And I have him with the TheraBand in the arms. Once again, TheraBand around the arms, side lunges. He had, a, ironically, I'm at the point, this is a couple of weeks ago, he did a side lunge to the right. He was actually pretty good. He did a slide lunge to the left. He was not so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, well, not really. You've been, you've been training. You've been doing you know, different movement patterns. You're gonna, it's going to switch on and off. So mm -hmm. what I ended up doing is I basically uh, put a few, th I put a few uh, TheraBands, like a yellow, red, green around his, just to really give him some stability in his upper, in his upper quarter, in his trunk. And then he, I had him, I got my hands on his body. And then when he did a lunge to the left and I felt him move in a way that he, that would have been detrimental to his performance, I told him to stop. I said, stop right there, look down. And he, and he looked at, he saw where his feet were. And so he was able to self-correct. So I did a lot of that, you know, hands on my hands on his mm -hmm. trunk, you know, side lunging, stop, look down. So just like motor learning, just training over and over and over mm -hmm. again in a position or a movement that is relevant for this kid. That's meaningful because this is where he has problems. So I stepped back. This was probably after 15. I was like getting my workout that day, 15 side lunges. I stepped back and I watched him do it on his own and he was fine. He still falters, you know, occasionally, but. Sure. It takes that, time to build those programs. Exactly. And I said, this, you need to do volume of this. But the, but the important thing is, is you took him from extrinsic input to intrinsic correction. Right. And that's where the magic lies. We can externally, you know, ex, we can give extrinsic cues, but if they don't begin to assimilate it and have intrinsic cues to to change error detection and error control intrinsically, it's not going to change. Right. And, and so, you know, the magic is getting on and helping him feel it, pointing it out, working with him, 
but backing off, pulling those things away as fast as you can and let them start doing the motoric problem solving. Yes. And it's interesting. He was away for a couple of weeks on vacation this summer and he came back and he said, oh, my back's really sore. And, I'm like, and he's like, I know what I did. He was on one of those wakeboards, you know, the, I, where you like push up. Mm -hmm. And so he did a push up and he's like, oh, I, my whole back just jacked up. I'm like, okay. You know, and so that was a bit of a, you know, I had to like literally problem solve that with him on the fly. And he doesn't do very well with closed chain arms. He's very weak in his arms, very weak in the triceps and push ups. So I explained to him, I said, the same thing. My guess is you just, number one, that's a really hard, hard move to do. Abdominals, you need a ton of abdominals for something like that to stand on a moving board. And then you have to push off with your triceps, which are inherently weak. So it doesn't surprise me that your body just use whatever muscle it normally uses to get yourself up and standing, which is your back. And so not surprising. And so he's out of that now. Um, he's fine. So I'm going back to the heel raise. So I saw him last a couple of weeks ago and I, I said, how is your heel raise coming? He's like, oh, it's not that great. I'm like, oh, really? Show me. So he, he, he does the heel raise and it's like a three plus. I'm like, oh, that's so much better. Mm -hmm. I said, can you put the yellow TheraBand around your arms? And just do your heel raise for me. I'm curious. So what does he do? He does the heel raise and he shoots right up. Yep. And I'm like, okay, so was there an inherent weakness there or was there some motor control or nerve root? And because I, the minute you said nerve root, I thought of this two weeks ago and I was like, it was definitely better. But the minute I just gave him something, mm -hmm. some sort of TheraBand to control his, his, dare I say alignment, you mm -hmm. know, in standing, go up, shot up to a five. It just changes five. motor pattern. Yeah. It just changes five. motor pattern. Um, it'd be interesting. That's why I was wondering if I was saying, asking if you had done a, a reflex I will. on him because, <laughs> well, you know, now it's like probably irrelevant, but yeah. um, you know, then it, it would just been interesting to see because they, they probably would have been fine. Right. Like, right. but that's just kind of helpful to kind of know. Hmm. Yes. You know, is this a, is this a, and this is the thing that we get into with people is like, people say, they come to me, you know, my, my, my glutes don't activate. And it's like, because you're not putting yourself in a position for them to turn on. Your glutes will do what you need them to do when you need them to do it. Right. But if you're going to stand this way, there's no reason for your glutes to work. Right. You know, and it's just, but then that was him. There was no reason for his foot to work because he wasn't going to do that. Exactly. You know, his trunk was way over to the left. That's where it was going to live. And that's where he was. Yeah. And it probably had been for a long time. So you're thinking visuals, optics, cervical spine, balance reactions, you know, head rotations. Everything has been over on this left side for so long. No wonder it's difficult for him to like begin to kind of shift back. Yes. And it's, you know? it's, yes, because he's now doing part-time work and he's folding and doing things. He's in a sort of forward bend position and his back is flaring up just a tad in that position. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a new movement pattern. He has never done that. He's, he doesn't do that. And so we're working on him, getting him to, mm -hmm. to get and go in and out of that movement pattern without kicking his back in. So mm -hmm. that's, I think a one-off thing. Uh, but his main sort of side to side is significantly better. So primarily my, my treatment has been geared towards the foot, more of a, of a loss of control than a, like a, you know, like a stiff, rigid foot. He did not have a stiff, rigid foot, trust me. Um, but we did do release. I gave him self release. I did a lot of dynamic uh, movement, uh, dynamic training with my hands on there. And I also with the, as you mentioned, the intrinsic, I love that. He's, he needs to feel what I feel. Mm -hmm. He needs to feel what I feel. And that's for him is the way he learns better. And we're at the point now where I've actually like, so for example, a lateral lunge will be difficult for someone who has a foot issue easier for other people. So that's the main thing I'm training now. However, I've noticed he's got his inherent weakness in his upper quarter. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I think that maybe that 20% of that why he didn't, when he squatted, he was just losing control. So I'm giving him some closed chain, bearing in mind that's what got his back flared up over the summer, but uh, closed chain and the wall push-ups, oh. you know. Well, you're back, you're, yeah, you're backing down what, what he did, you know, what flared him up over the summer was this novel situation where he had to do a lot of probably over recruitment 
to yeah. make it ha you know and he's got sensitivity i mean yeah this yeah. has been going on long enough that there's a there's a there's a partial central sensitivity going on here there's a peripheral sensitivity too evidently yes. but there's a central one as well and so what you're teaching him is not to be afraid of his flares right you know right. like okay well that's a new movement pattern and you've never done that before you've never stood yeah. and done this kind of stuff before so let's unpack it and right. not be afraid of it right you know and so yeah like you said it's it's important because all this other stuff is getting better but he's going to have flares yes and, you, and you so can, it's it's good for him to learn that he doesn't yeah. have to be afraid of the flares that flares can be instructive right and so you're taking that really challenging thing of getting up on a wakeboard and just actually bringing it down to a level to where he can develop some strength and control around that correct and you know, you know, having him do a plank and a well, floor push up, there's no way. He doesn't have the upper body strength to do it. He'll use his back. I've seen it. It's, I would never start him there ever because he would totally make him worse. So you know, we're progressing the foot, adding some upper th you know, thoracic control. Uh, I would like to get him into a full plank at some point, uh, but that's uh, I, I think that's uh, you know, go, go down the road. His meaningful issue at this point is still the side to side. He wants to get more. He wants to continue to get his, his calves stronger um, mm -hmm. and, and really rehab him. And I think rehab himself fully versus mm -hmm. just doing a symptomatic body part, which he's been doing for so long. Yeah. Uh, so I think he's bought all into it. But uh, that's how I'm going to progress him. And, you know, you can progress. There's many ways we can go with this. Uh, you know, side lunging on a BOSU. I mean, there's, there's so many, you know, ways you can, you can, you can exercise him. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I like working with young kids like this because I think that you have to make it fun in a way. I mean, that's mm -hmm. fun for us. Uh, and he's not the kind of person that would, I, I, I think at this point, you know, lying him down on the table and working on his back or even working on his foot for the entire hour is so not well, fun and so not worthwhile. Well, it's not going to do anything to change anything for him. No, no. That's no. the thing is that there's, that's, there's, you know, you're not going to get these over recruiting muscles to change by poking no. away at them. No. You're going to get them to change by changing how they move and helping them find meaningful ways to move that is less symptomatic. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's where the evidence is taking us. That's where, you know, clinical yeah. reasoning is taking us. And that's, this is a case in point of just exactly that. I mean, there's so many kind of cool things he can do. You know, he can eventually work on side jumps over, a, you know, a bench, you know, jumping over, like even the small to start with and bigger. He can have the BOSU ball in between and step up and step down sideways, like quickly. Yep. You know, to work that, you can work at diagonals. You can pull out the old clock on the floor thing and, you know, mm -hmm. get them lunging and jumping onto the different numbers. I mean, there's a thousand yes. things he can do that's going yes. to yes. incorporate all of this new motor pattern and, and, and motor training that you've given him to just higher and higher and faster levels. Mm -hmm. But yeah. he needed to have, he needed to really feel the difference and, and not, and, and not be afraid of the pain. He needed to learn that he could really do things that weren't going to give him the same symptoms. Yeah. You yeah, know, I think and that, it, that would, it cha and it changed for him and he, and it changed in a way that was movement for him, which was so much more meaningful. Yeah. And I'll just, one final thought. I think that for him, getting my hands on him when we just want to trial a new movement. So I, I, I always leave time at the end. Let's say, I, let's say I want to give him side lunges, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't just say do 10 lunges and like watch him. I actually leave time in the clinic, put my hands on him, put my hands on the areas of interest and have him do a side lunge. And if I think something's moving non optimally or he's got symptoms, we'll problem solve that before he walks yeah. out the door. Yeah, exactly. And that's in the real ultimate. time. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I would urge clinicians to really get, get your hands on them when they're moving. You just really follow their movement patterns with your own hands and you can close your eyes. I, I think for me that that's been, you know, uh, an experience over the years. I enjoy doing them. I enjoy moving with them uh, because I can feel things quicker, mm -hmm. you know, quicker, especially when you're doing something like that. So those are my thoughts. Um, I'm still treating him. So uh, we'll provide updates as, as they, as they come. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Bye.